Last week in Beijing, China's leaders gathered for four days to discuss national policy and set the economic agenda for the next five years. It's called the Fifth Plenum of the 18th Central Committee, and it focused on China's 13th five-year plan, 2016 to 2020. With China's economy slowing and reform entering deep waters, China's challenges are more complex than ever, and now the whole world is watching. What are the key issues? What are the key guidelines? What about China's GDP growth rate on which the world remains fixated? Do new policies break with the past? What are the differences between the new five-year plan about to begin and the current five-year plan about to end? What industries are favored? What social programs? What about the obstacles that China's economy faces? What are potential pitfalls? What's the role anyway of a five-year plan, a staple of the planned economy in China's socialist market economy? Finally, critically, what about China's anti-corruption campaign? Is it slowing down? The fifth plenum gets us closer to China. At the fifth plenary session of the 18th CPC Central Committee, which took place October 26 to 29, party leaders issued guidelines for the 13th five-year plan that maps out strategies for the economic and social development of China from 2016 to 2020. The communique released after the fifth plenum stressed the goals of building a moderately prosperous society and promoting sustainable and healthy economic and social development. To achieve these goals, the plenum called for maintaining economic growth at a medium-high level, doubling the 2010 GDP per capita income of urban and rural residents by 2020. It emphasized the importance of innovation. The highlights of the communique include the adoption of a two-child policy, further liberalization of pricing for certain commodities and service sectors, and the transfer of some national assets to secure the Social Security Fund. The new plan is strategically important, as 2020 is the target year for realizing China's goal of a moderately well-off society in all respects. Many believe that the goal will be achieved given the success of the current five-year plan. What China needs to improve most over the next five years is its medical treatment. It's not well balanced. The medical treatments in big cities like Beijing are good, but not so much in small cities and remote areas. I hope our educational system can learn more from the West. It needs to be more liberal so that students can learn what they're interested in. That can help us develop more talented people for society. China's economy is now transforming. Some industries have been quite profitable, but at the same time harmful to sustainable development. So we need to give up on them and find new and sustainable ways for China's economy. Because in China, the Communist Party is the ruling party. <coughs> Right. So the Communist Party should decide, the committee, the central committee of the Communist Party is a decider of the f those development targets and so on and so forth. So every five year, the plenum is the plenum of the member of the central committee of the Communist Party that will decide in what direction China will evolve. And then once target set, the dating work will be assumed by Chinese government. So right. From the state council. From the state council. So the, the party is sell, setting the goals, the targets, mm -hmm. the guidelines, yes. and making them formal. Then the government takes over and, and, and implements. That's mm -hmm. the, the, Try the, to the implement process. and to sure. buy by uh, concrete measures. So if we look at how the fifth plenum of the CPC Central Committee and the 13th five-year plan articulate, the plenum gives the overall uh, guidelines and policy as the ruling party for the country. Then the 13th five-year plan is the uh, official um, guidelines for the government, which is approved next March at the NPC. And uh, the uh, NDRC, National Development and Reform Commission, is responsible for a good uh, part of that. Now, I explain a little bit of your own role in terms of the research that backs it up. Uh, yes, actually, uh, the, 
the research institution, uh, including our institute, uh, get involved deeply in the, the preparation of the whole of the, uh, the planning. So the first things we do actually is to, to conduct uh, the study. Uh, so that was started in the last April. Uh, the 25 uh, the, the topic uh, were, were identified. So of the 25 topics, where, where did they come from? Was that generated internally in NDRC um, in terms of deciding on 25? Uh, why 25? Why not 15 or why not 50? How, how do you get to 25 and who decides? Uh, NDRC actually they, they play a leading role in identifying these 25 topics, but they also have a wide consultation with uh, different ministries, uh, industries, the business people. So. We, uh, we think all of these 25 things are most important in the next five years. So uh, that gets uh, also approved uh, from the State Council. So we start all of the studies because the previous policy does not produce the result that people expected. So that do generate some urgency. And also, you know, for the population, it's uh, long-term things. Full Frame, a new weekly talk show from CCTV America, featuring newsmaker interviews. It's looking at a blank piece of paper and envisioning all the things you could put there and which is the one you'll choose, which is the best one. Women are the most subjugated people on the planet. 70% of the people living on less than $2 a day are women. Focused on the causes and events that are mobilizing people around the world to take action for change. It really uh, brings people together that way. It's, it's not about the individuals, it's uh, what five people can do together. Plus, a look at new innovations in art, culture, science, and technology. Depending on which study you look at, it's between 49 and 99 percent effective against preventing HIV transmission. And social issues that connect us all. You empower them now with information. That's education. And close-ups on human stories. Now those layers of paint hold a lot of memory. That make the extraordinary seem possible. If we don't feel love and, and joy within ourselves, then we're not going to project that into the world. And so that's a burst of energy. And that's new. I'm Mike Walter in Los Angeles. Let's take it full frame. Full frame and CCTV America taking you further. One of the highlights of China's new five-year plan is that the country will loosen its decades-long one-child family planning policy. When the one-child policy was first introduced in 1970s, China's population was already approaching one billion. By comparison, over four decades, India, another massively populated country, saw its population nearly double. China calculates that its one-child policy helped avert some 400 million births, more than the entire U.S. population, and with them, severe strains on resources like agriculture, education, the environment, and health care. This is the first step to try and, uh, you know, kind of increase or stabilize China's growth rate because it does need, strangely enough, uh, more people to do the jobs it needs to have done. But uh, whether it will actually incentivize people to have more children, uh, that's really a big, big unknown. 
Despite an easing in the mid-1980s for the most part, the policy remained unchanged. Until 2013, when couples that included one only child spouse were allowed to have a second child, the fifth plenum will extend that right to all couples. The implementation of this policy will optimize China's demographic structure, increase labor supply, alleviate the pressure of an aging society, and promote a balanced development of population. If there's just one child, it won't have a companion. You just feel that you're alone at home all day. It's too expensive to raise kids in China. I don't make enough money. I don't even have enough to spend on myself. The attention in the uh, headlines, certainly around the world, uh, it's only a small part of what the plenum has actually really done, but it's gotten the headlines, uh, the relaxation of the one-child policy after 36 years or something, uh, to where families can now have two children. Uh, wh what's the significance of that, and is that something in the 13th five-year plan, or that's, that's a policy decision totally outside of it, but announced now? Uh, I think it can say both. <laughs> That's something actually, yeah, also in the, the proposal, but also something has been discussed for some time. So I think maybe it's the right timing to announce uh, this big uh, policy. Uh, you know, we actually experienced some decline of working age population. Those changes have been talked quite uh, uh, some time, but uh, uh, for me, I think it's a little bit faster than I expect. Mm. So I, I think the, the top leader, the, uh, they make the, this uh, very important uh, uh, policy, uh, policy change. Uh, just like you said, we, we have 30 years of family planning in the program, one child policy. So the mentality, not easy to change. So I think the top leader, they, they have strong determination to, to change this. And we've only had a day or two, but uh, what's been the general reaction among, uh, uh, among the professionals uh, in, the, in the research community? Uh, I think basically it uh, created with uh, uh, welcome, you see. Uh, I think it's power people with more the freedom um, and uh, may not create uh, uh, another round of the boom because some uh, service shows uh, only not every qualified couple, not every couple to want to have the two children. So I think it's, uh, it's still a smooth transition uh, in terms of population development. If we look at the change in the one child policy, uh, this is coming barely two years after the the earlier change allowing a couple to have two children if one of the spouses was a single child. Now suddenly two years later, which seems like a short time in, uh, in China's perspective, does, does that indicate that the earlier uh, reform was recognized as not being effective because not too many children, <laughs> new children were being born and the problem was more urgent than they might have thought? Yeah, I think that's one of the factors, uh, because the previous policy does not produce the result uh, as people expected. So that do generate some urgency. And also, you know, for the population, it's uh, long-term things, so you have to act earlier. Otherwise, you cannot see the, the fact of maybe in the 20 years, 30 years. So that's something I think we need to act now. Uh, uh, I say uh, it, it surprised me because it involves a big change in the mentality. Uh, previously, I think it's not easy. Uh, it's not easy, uh, but they do, so I, I think it's a good thing. I like the example because it shows how the Chinese government works. Uh, you put out a policy and you monitor it, and if you find it's not working, you change it. Um, I, I think uh, it, it, it's helpful for people to understand that because uh, people uh, perhaps uh, in foreign countries uh, think of Chinese uh, government in some sort of an authoritarian monolith, um, uh, but it's uh, exquisitely sensitive to the results of policy and the feedback is rapid uh, from many sources. 
So I, I think this is actually a good example beyond the one-child policy itself about how the government monitors policy and how it changes policy based upon results, the famous, uh, uh, you know, seek truth from facts that uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, made famous, right? While in a conversation, he said, we envy you, we American, we envy you China because you have five-year plan. From emerging powers to expanding partnerships, from fighting poverty to combating climate change, booming economies, war-ravaged nations, and everything in between. We capture the changes affecting the most dynamic and diverse continent on the planet, taking you beyond the headlines to the people and their stories. Asia Today, delivering Asia to the world. Uncovering the truth. We are on our way to Leari, one of the most dangerous districts in the city of Karachi. We were told that we're just about to cross the border between Malaysia and the Philippines. Going the distance to get the story. We meet the real people with real hope. For many young Thais, Muay Thai is one of the only ways to lift their families out of poverty. Behind every corner is a great story. Assignment Asia. Expect the unexpected. This is Tai Yu Su, a nail stylist. Tsai used to work in a nail salon with a fixed income, but now he's a millionaire in the making. I used to work six days a week from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. in a nail salon, and my earning was six to seven thousand yuan a month. Now I can earn twenty to thirty thousand easily. The secret to Tsai's success is this mobile app. The app allows customers to choose where and when they like their nail care service done, and it delivers that message directly to nail care providers. In the first three quarters of 2015, over 3 million new businesses were registered in China, jumping 20% over the corresponding period of 2014. The growth in information and software technologies is especially important. Grassroots innovation and startups have had an impact on big industry players, forcing them to change faster. Innovation-driven entrepreneurship is seen by the government as a new engine for driving China's new normal, which trades speed of development in exchange for higher quality of development. Uh, I think in, in, uh, in the proposal, actually, uh, CPC stressed the role of innovation and put it uh, on the top of the, all of the policy agenda. They said we need to put the innovation at the core of a whole our work. So I think innovation uh, policy uh, will be the uh, most important things in the next five year plan. And uh, in the communicate uh, also mentioned uh, several uh, policy measures to, to stimulate uh, the innovation. After the struggle of more than 30 years, 660 million Chinese have been lifted out of poverty. But there are 592 poverty-stricken countries, with 30 million families still living under poverty line. The Central Committee promised to lift all 70 million people from living under the poverty line by 2020. In other words, lifting poverty-stricken counties and people living under poverty line is the bottom line of achieving a well-off society. 
When it comes to the level of income, well-off is a situation that sits between just enough and rich. So building a well-off society in an all-round way means we are still not a rich country, not a country of high income. It will not change the fact that China is a developing country, but people's income will be raised significantly. Let's talk about some of the other policy uh, uh, guidelines from the Fifth Plenum. There are many in the social dimension. Uh, uh, eliminating poverty completely uh, is a very strong goal in a very short time. Uh, to hit 2020, the end of the 13 five-year plan, is uh, corresponding to the the so-called first 100 of, of China's goal to be a moderately prosperous society by 2020, uh, but to eliminate poverty completely, no even though China has had remarkable success so far, is a, is a pretty ambitious uh, goal that's set, set forth. How, how important is that in the, in the totality? Uh, yes, you, you mentioned we set the target uh, of to, to build a, a moderately the prosperous society by the 2020. Uh, so if we review the, all of this target, uh, the poverty issue is still the weak link uh, of this uh, uh, target. So I think uh, in, the, in the final five year, uh, we need to tackle those weak link. So the poverty reduction uh, is just uh, this uh, weak link, so it's concerned uh, if or not we can achieve this uh, target. Some people would say that in today's sophisticated market economy so globalized that the idea of five-year plans are, are really archaic, uh, that they were of course germane to a uh, planned economy because that's what it is, you planned the number of shoes and uh, uh, computer keyboards and uh, socks that you produced, and uh, that was the planned economy, which everybody knows in the world doesn't work. Uh, now China's moving to a market economy, you call it a socialist market economy, uh, uh, and the five-year plans have become five-year guidelines, perhaps, not as uh, rigorous and just giving general direction. But are they still relevant, um, or should the, the government just institute policies and and not give such firm guidelines every five years. Five years is an arbitrary period. I mean, things can change. Uh, you know, five years wasn't set at the foundation of the universe. It was sort of an arbitrary number. Um, I think it's relevant because, you know, it uh, shows the long-term vision and uh, the, the path, you know, for the development in the future. So that, that actually the help the private sector, uh, you know, to plan their own the, the investment, their uh, the, 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 uh, their investment, because many investment uh, will stay there for quite a long time. So they need to, they have to look in the future. Uh, so I think it's still very helpful, and also uh, the guideline identify the you know. The important the area the the government want to put results in, so that also you know can motivate the private sector to work with government together to achieve that goal. And also in in this guideline, not every target uh, is mandatory. Uh, now the economic indicator basically is indicative, uh, but for the Target for the environmental protection and some social target. They are mandatory, so that also help, you know, to to guide the the whole level of the government to achieve uh, that goal, to put more resources to to that goal. So I think uh, for both private sector and for the whole of government, uh, for the especially for the local government, it is still very meaningful choose. On the topic of necessity of development plan, 
we had a very interesting discussion with Jeffrey Sachs, mm -hmm. uh, an economy professor mm -hmm. of Columbia University. Mm -hmm. When he was in, in Harvard University, he conceived the shock therapy yeah. plan for Poland yeah, and then yeah, for yeah. Russia. So right. we know that he, you cannot blame him for his, uh, his enthusiasm for market economy. Right. While in a conversation, he said, we envy you we American, we in you know, China because you have five-year plan. You can do everything you, know, you uh, in your five-year plan. Uh, at the same time, short, uh, middle-term, and long-term targets, mm. and then you move your, your economy steadily towards this final objective. Mm. Mm. In the U.S., we need this kind of, uh, <laughs> they call it NDRC, yeah. National State <laughs> yeah. Development and the Reform Commission. Yeah, and, and do you think this will be maintained for a long time, or is this sort of a part of the, the transition that China is making from a planned economy to a fully market economy? Uh, is, is, is this part of a transition, or is this something that's endemic and, and will always be part of, of China's socialist market economy? I think that we may need uh, always, anyway, we may need some plan. Uh, but the plan is not that compensatory. So you, 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 you don't have these compared today's plan with, yeah, yeah. say, uh, a plan 30 years ago. Right, right. It's totally different. Okay. Because uh, in the past, we, China, in a planning economy, everything is planned. The target has been set by the. Uh, <laughs> Planning commission yeah. for everything. And if you're going to make but, shoes, you're going to make 500 million shoes. Yes. <laughs> nowadays, is, the plan is, is not in that way. So nowadays, the plan is the broad ideas about development. In what direction you have to move your economy? Transforming the economy while sustaining medium high growth is the grand vision of the just concluded fifth plenum of the 18th CPC Central Committee as it establishes the 13th five-year plan to guide China's continuing development. The plan spells out what China must do by 2020 to realize a moderately prosperous society, which is the first of President Xi Jinping's four comprehensives and the first part of the Chinese dream. Essential is eliminating poverty. Although the expected target growth rate of roughly 6.5% gets all the headlines, more important is industrial restructuring away from labor-intensive and high-polluting manufacturing to higher-value added and service industries and raising the contribution of consumption. Innovation is put at the core position, especially in science, technology, and culture. Other major drivers include urbanization, price reforms, especially in energy, and improved government services. Social security will be strengthened, high school education made universal, and the one-child family planning policy relaxed to allow two children. There are many challenges. Slowing growth, interest groups resisting reform, industrial overcapacity, embedded pollution. Finally, Whoever thought China's anti-corruption campaign would be slowing down thought wrong. Ten senior officials were expelled from the party, and the plenum communique noted that strictly governing the party means that officials don't want to be corrupt, don't dare to be corrupt, and couldn't be corrupt even if they did. We'll follow Shisan Wu, the 13 five-year plan to keep closer to China.